you guys are getting the hang of saying good morning to me from there. That's great. I love the, I love the enthusiasm. Welcome. And we want to welcome our guests and visitors today as well and invite you all to participate in the liturgy at whatever level you feel comfortable. Um, thanks, Marilyn, for the prayer. That's one of my favorite hymns. And uh, thank you for being here. I know you're struggling a bit, so we appreciate that as well. Uh, you see the announcements in the bulletin. Um, I want to draw your attention specifically to uh, the deacons meeting that's right after church today. Uh, you want to meet in the hall, or is that where you want to meet, Marilyn? We'll have to move it to you. Okay, yeah. sure. And then also, next Sunday, the congregational meeting, the annual meeting. This is a mandated meeting by our Book of Order that we are required to have each year. And at that meeting, um, we will vote to elect officers. We will also, uh, you will be presented with the budget. You'll see what we uh, have budgeted for 2024. And so I encourage all members particularly to show up. If you're not a member and you still wanna see what's going on, feel free to come and we'll make sure that you have able to participate in the discussions at the very least. Also, Bible study, I screwed this up last week, and um, Bible study is actually at 5.30 instead of 5. My bad, so I apologize for that. 5.30. 5.30, yeah, I screwed it up. Sorry about that. Uh, are there other announcements that I may have missed this week? Peggy. I know it's listed here, but I would just like to say that on Thursday the 25th at 12.30, we're going to have So everyone's input is very important, so please come. Okay. Other announcements? Um, Go ahead, Vita. I think the, thing is the weather's pretty nice now, so let's try our Thursday social at 5 o'clock and be ready to come. I think the weather is going to be conducive so that we'll, we'll still meet inside, but 5 o'clock we'll have our Thursday social. Everybody's invited. Thank you. All right. And along those lines, when session met on Thursday, we have uh, moved our session meetings to 1 o'clock on the second Thursdays of the month, starting next month. So that should help with uh, the social. So anyway, all right. Other announcements? Okay, Vita, I'll ask you to come forward for a minute permission. Okay. Tall. You would just shrink? Because <laughs> I can't seem to get any taller. I even got heels on. All right. All right. So today is per capita Sunday. Some of you know what per capita is and some of you don't. But in essence, per capita is a set amount of money, apportionment uh, per member that congregations pay to a larger Presbyterian church, USA. All Presbyterians share in the benefit of the Presbyterian church system of government. So every Presbyterian is asked to share the expenses associated with coordinating and performing the functions of that system. So why per capita? Per capita exists as a way for all Presbyterians to share costs that belong to the whole church to give meaning to the in, in, interdependent nature, nature Presbyterian polity. Per capita is part of the glue that holds the Presbyterians together. It exists to allow the whole church to share equitably in those things that make us Presbyterian our theology identity, our connectedness, our system of mid-councils that allows elders and members to get ministers together to discern the mind of Christ, our ecumenical connections that make us part of the church universal, our core structures that keep us together as a church, and our call to work for participation and decision-making. Per capita allows us to work with other churches to further the mission of Jesus Christ around the world. The earliest mention of something like a per capita apportionment dated back to the 1700s. 
and in the mid-1800s a plan of mileage was adopted by the General Assembly to defray the expenses of commissioners attending General Assembly meetings so that everyone could be present to participate regardless of distance or financial resources. Over time, per capita has been used to fund ecclesiastical and administrative functions that are shared by the whole church. And so, this applies to those who are members of our church, and our per capita now has been increased, so per capita now is $9.80 per person. So you know now more about when you pay that, if, if you pay, and we encourage all of you to pay that because the church pays for it anyway. So, how much? $9.80. Okay. It used problem. to be $47. Well, that's what you that's gave. The, that's the General Assembly's piece of it. There's more. There would also be a piece from the, from the Presbytery, which is not, which is, I can't remember the exact amount. But that, the, the 980 covers the General Assembly apportionment. The total is 44. Okay, so the total, the total per capita then is 44. All right, now you heard it from him. I thought it was more. Okay, so we're asked to pay that per capita. So if, if you so would like, you could uh, pay that per capita whenever you would like. We have to pay that. It's due in March. And um, if you put it on your check or the envelope that is for per capita, I'll make sure that I credit that to per capita. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Rita. You're welcome. Let's take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. We gather together on this day and in this place to worship God, who is the rock of our salvation. Please join in our intro hymn number 664, All Verses of Morning Has Broken. To worship. From God alone comes my salvation. From God alone, my soul lays inside. God alone is my rock and salvation. God is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Please stand now and join me in hymn number 32. I sing the mighty power of God.
that song. It just kind of tells the whole story. Join me now in the prayer of confession. Forgiving God, we repent all the ways we turn from you. We call, but we do not listen. You show us your path, but we prefer your own way. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you, that we might show mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the word of God. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and given new life. Thanks be to God. And as we have reconciled with Christ, let us reconcile with one another through a sharing of the peace of Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you. to ask prayers uh, for Michael. We've had him on the list before. He kind of comes on and off the list. Um, I'm in the process of getting him ready to move to Logan, to a, a, a care facility in Logan, and that's going to be a bit um, challenging uh, for him, but I am thinking that it's going to be a good thing for him and a, good, and a good thing for myself as well, having him that much closer. It means that when I get to go to Palm Springs, I get to go for a real vacation instead of actual work, which is kind of exciting for me. And thank you, too, for your prayers as Bruce and I were in Palm Springs last week. Um, we had a good time, didn't want to come back, but here we are. So we did come back after all. Um, I will ask if there are any other joys or concerns that didn't make it on the list this week? You know, I, saw, I saw one that I forgot to put on, but I saw it on a different bulletin and somebody had asked for prayers for Chad Bybee. Oh, yes. I didn't get him on. So. Okay. We can put him on for next week. Cool. Are there others? Bruce? My daughter Molly. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Molly Snow. Oh. Sorry, Vita. Um, I put out on the service a prayer for Curtis Ham. Yes. Um, he had a stroke, and it appears that it's, it's affected just his speech, which we're very lucky. But prayers for him that whatever, however it affected him, that he will be able to recover. Excellent. Thank you. Any others? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy One, we are grateful for the opportunity to be here together today in your presence and in each other's company. And as we note, every week is not something that we take for granted because there are so many who do not have this opportunity. Holy One, you've heard the prayers spoken aloud, and we lift them to you, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy One, we continue to lift up Chris, Tammy's sister Deborah, John and Candy and their family, Joe, and Dagmar and Erica. And we pray, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We continue to lift up Donna and Cindy, Sandra, Al and his family, Rossi, Scott and his family. And we pray saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we continue to lift up Julie, Katie's family, Wendy, Joe R., Becky and Ruth, and Chris. And we pray saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we lift up Blair and Blair's grandson, McKay. We continue to lift up Michael, Richard C., Shane, Paula, and Ron and Connie. And we pray, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to lift up Jim and Josette, Steve, Cheryl, Jana and Todd, and their cousin Jeff. We lift up Kathy, Alicia, and Steve. And we pray, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we continue to lift up Kathy R., Billy Joe, Ross, and Linda, and Damien. And we pray, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we continue to lift up the work of the Belize Mission. We pray today for victims of violence, war, and disaster, especially those in Gaza, Palestine, Israel, and Ukraine. And today, Holy One, we also pray for our country and its leaders. And we pray for peace and kindness in our hearts, in our community, and in our world. And we pray these things saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, Holy One, we take a moment of silence to lift those joys, those concerns that we hold so deeply within us that we are unable to speak them aloud. And all of these things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join in our hymn of preparation, number 175, Seek Ye First.
welcome. <clears throat> Our Old Testament reading today comes from Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and I'll be reading from the message translation. And it's entitled, Maybe God Will Change His Mind. Next, God spoke to Jonah a second time. Upon your feet and on your way to the city of Nineveh, preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. This time Jonah started off straight for Nineveh, obeying God's words, orders to the letter. Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk and preached. In 40 days Nineveh will be smashed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed citywide fast and dressed in burlap to a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. And our, our psalm reading today comes from Psalm 62 verses 5 through 12. God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as he says. Everything I hope for comes from him, so why not? His rock under my, his, his, he's solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul. I'm impregnable, ca an impregnable castle. I'll set my life, I'll set, I'm set for life. My help and glory are in God, granite, strength, and safe harbor, God. So trust Him absolutely, people. Lay your lives on the line for Him. God is a safe place to be. Man as such is smoke. Women as such is mirage. Put them together, they're nothing. Two times nothing is nothing. And in windfall, if it comes, don't make too much of it. God said this once and for all. How many times have I heard it repeated? Our third reading today comes from Mark. Chapter 1, verses 14 through 20, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version today. <coughs> Excuse me. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Friends, these readings are God's word for God's people, and we respond by saying, Thanks be to God. So, <clears throat> preaching every week can be a bit tricky if you want the truth. I absolutely love preaching. I love having the opportunity to deep dive into God's Word, as well as the challenge of presenting it to you each and every week. Still, it can be interesting and somewhat frustrating at times. There's the fact that Sunday comes, each around, comes around each and every single week, whether I want it to or not. And that means I'm always under a deadline to create a meaningful, scripture-based sermon for you. One that I hope leaves you with more questions than answers. In addition to the relentless return of Sunday each week, there are times when I seriously wrestle with a particular text. 
sometimes there's so many themes to choose from, it's difficult to land on a particular topic. Other times there's very little to go on, and that's where I found myself with the Mark reading for today. As I've mentioned before, Mark was a pretty no-nonsense kind of guy. He painted with a very broad brush and assumed that his readers knew exactly what he was talking about, so he didn't feel the need to provide much detail. In the six short verses of this particular passage, we see Jesus proclaiming the good news on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now most of us know what's going to happen next because this narrative is captured in all four of the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John to follow him. And they all immediately leave everything, their livelihood, their communities, even as in the case of James and John, their families. I'm not sure that if I had been in that situation, I would have been willing to take that risk. Yet that's what these four fishermen did. Now when I'm writing a sermon, I often will focus on a phrase or an idea articulated in the text, something to hang my hat on, if you will. This week, what caught my attention was verse 15, where Jesus says, in part, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Now, what made me stop and think was the apparent conflict between the words fulfilled and near. If we think about it, the combination of these two words in this contest context simply does not make sense. How can something be both completed, as the word fulfilled implies, and still not be completed, as the word near seems to tell us? It can be a struggle to reconcile these two very different ideas, and struggle I did this week. However, if we remember that God is in all, through all, and around all, perhaps what Jesus, who we understand to be God incarnate, is saying here, begins to make a little bit more sense. And what Jesus is saying in this situation is that it's not an either-or proposition, but instead a both-and proposition. And I'll admit that looking at it this way kind of blew my mind, honestly. We humans think of time as a linear concept, don't we? We have a totally understandable desire to put timelines on the events of our lives. We want everything to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we see time as a straight line, past, present, and future. I would argue that in doing so, we forget that God exists outside of space and time. I'm sure that most of you have heard the phrase, God's time is not our time. It's a phrase I use quite often, and it is often used to explain to ourselves and to others why God doesn't seem to hear us. And it's also used as a source of comfort when God doesn't show up for us as soon or as fast as we would like. However, Isaac Watts, the author of the hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, captures the reality of the situation perfectly when he wrote, A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening God. God's time is indeed not our time. So where does that leave us? Our natural tendency to see time in a linear fashion creates a situation where it becomes very easy to put God in a box. In our human desire to define the undefinable, to have a beginning, middle, and an end to all of our experiences, we tend to draw lines around the divine. We limit who God is, not just for ourselves, but also for those around us. In effect, we bind God. 
I'm absolutely convinced that the God we worship is so much bigger than any boundary, any box we might put in place. Now, the most obvious example of putting God in a box and limiting the presence of the Creator shows up in the language we use to describe the Holy One. Father, Lord, He, Him, Master and King. These are all words, among many others, that have been used for centuries in an attempt to help us gain a small understanding of the true nature of God. These words show up in many of the beloved hymns of our faith and in most of the translations of our sacred text. And just to be clear, if those are the words that you use to understand and draw closer to God, that's just fine. However, for those of us who may not have had a good experience with our own fathers while we were growing up, using masculine language to define and understand God can, and often does, actually push some away from a closer relationship with the Holy One. That was certainly the case for me, and it took me a very, very long time to see God as a God of love, and not as the vengeful, angry God exemplified by my own father's behaviors and actions. Now, some, some folks are going to say that using male pronouns to describe God is the only way, the only appropriate way to talk about the divine because that's the way the Bible speaks about God. That argument fails to take into account translation errors as well as deliberate attempts to shape God's word in a certain way to promote an agenda that was meant to keep men in power in the church and in the culture. Of course, the exclusive use of male pronouns has been, and in some corners of Christendom, continues to be used to deny women their rightful place within the leadership of the church. Let me also note that the exclusive use of feminine language to refer to God, which has become popular in some circles, leaves us with exactly the same problem of exclusion. If God exists outside of space and time, as I firmly believe, and if we take this argument to its logical conclusion, what that means is that God transcends gender. God is neither male or female, and God cannot be constrained by our limited attempts to describe who and what God is. Again, I have no problem with others using specific pronouns to talk about God as the ultimate goal is for each of us to draw closer to the Holy One. And if that includes using specific language to define who and what God is, that's okay. However, I will challenge all of us, myself included, to unbind God. To take God out of the box, to erase the lines and boundaries which we are taught exist around the nature of God. And to expand our thinking, to entertain the possibility that the divine is more than what our limited human understanding can comprehend. Language is only one way we humans try to limit God. So here's a question for you. You knew that was coming, right? I think I'd do this on now. What other ways do we tend to limit or bind God? What other beliefs, practices, and customs do we participate in that limit God's ability to work through us in our lives and in the world around us? What do you think would happen if each and every one of us re-examined those beliefs, practices, and customs 
and chose to expand our understanding of who and what God is. Note that I'm using the word expanded here because I'm not asking anyone to change how they view God. What I'm encouraging all of us to do is to build on that foundation and expand how we see God. What if? What if God would truly unbound in our own lives and in our world? Imagine what could be accomplished if we took God out of the box. What if, like Simon, Andrew, James, and John, we were to answer the call to leave everything we knew about God behind and walk a different path? Your charge this week is to unbind God in your own life. Take a look at those beliefs, those practices, and those customs which may be putting limits on how God is present in your life. Build on your foundation of belief in God and expand who and what God is for you. In doing so, I believe we have an opportunity to bring about the kingdom of God right here and right now. Amen. I'll invite the ushers forward at this time for the morning offering. Thank you. of your bounty to you for the furtherance of the work of your kingdom in our world and in our community. We pray these things in gratitude in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing and join in our statement of faith, which is found on the insert in your bulletin. Before we do this, I just want to note that um, this has become our regular affirmation of faith in this, in this place, and so much so that we're going to have copies put, um, put in the hymn book, at the front of the hymn book. So in a few weeks, we won't have to worry about the inserts. So just so you all know that. This is a contemporary statement of faith adapted from the United Church of Christ. We believe in God, the source of all life, wholeness and love. We believe that God is revealed in Jesus Christ. We believe that in his life, Jesus reveals God in grace, mercy, forgiveness, and justice. We believe that in his death, Jesus reveals God's determined presence in the world, even in the face of hatred, violence, and pain. We believe that in his resurrection, Jesus reveals God, calling us to abundant life both now and forever, life beyond our fearful and fragile imaginations. We believe that God lives among us, within us, and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We believe that God moves us to be together in communities of faith, hope, and love. We believe these things, not out of certainty, but out of faith, as one whose trust in the reality of God revealed in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And join in our closing hymn, number 700, I'm going to live so God can use me. Thank you, Vita. Thank you, Marilyn, for helping out today. Appreciate all the effort. And also doing it on such short notice, Vita. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Hear this charge. Our God is much bigger than any box or boundary. Expand how you think about God and let the Holy One roam free to accomplish the Creator's purpose. And may God watch between me and thee, while we are absent one from another, and all God's people said, Alleluia. Amen. Amen. <coughs>